message here, and um, and, and really, that's uh, I've been mm, less concerned about the topic than about the text, which is um, the first chapter and a half of the book of Philippians. And so, if you want to turn to Philippians, we're going to read the first eleven verses of Philippians two. It, 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 Paul starts off by praying that wonderful prayer that we, we talked about two weeks ago um, at the end of that first section, um, that, that prayer that, that talks about uh, uh, the, the Philippian people discerning what's best, um, having an instructed love. Uh, it, it, it's a wonderful prayer. And then Paul goes into that section that we had last week in which he expresses his own fears. He says, I'm, uh, I'm not sure what's gonna happen, I might die. I might be executed by the Romans. I don't know what's gonna happen, um, but I pray for the courage to be able to not embarrass Christ in, in what I do. And then he prays the same thing for the Philippians who, um, who are in that place where they are probably likely to suffer persecution themselves. This is kind of persecution literature. And he's saying to them, I'm also thinking about you and you're gonna need courage for the future. So whether I'm there or not, you know, be courageous. And then he kind of grounds that that whole concept of courage in this. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, I like better, have the same mind as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess, it says acknowledge, that Jesus Christ is the Lord. To the glory of God the Father, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. So think like Jesus, huh? Isn't that what the text says? It's a little more complicated than that. Um, It's it's talking to them, it's all plurals. It's saying, um, um, have this mind among you, in you, not not just you as individuals, but you as a congregation, you as a church, you as a people of God, you as a community of witness in this corner of, of Edison and Euclid, have this mind in you, which is the mind of Jesus Christ. Think like Jesus. And then the question always is, so what does it mean to think like Jesus, right? Remember we used to wear those bracelets, um, what would Jesus do, WWJD? Um, And and we would, uh, there we go, there we go. (laughs) Sometimes I push this thing when I'm, um, when I'm, I'm doing my Bible. So excuse me if the if thing so pops over, it's, it's me. Um, but but it, we're, we're starting, you know, if you do WWJD, you know, the, the, the question always which arose was, so what would Jesus do? How do we know what Jesus would do? And, and sometimes people interpreted that in ways which is not so much what would Jesus do as, you know, what would Jane do or what would John do? You know, it's, it, it became a, an excuse for doing whatever it is that they wanted to do. But it's pretty clear what Jesus does. It's a good principle. Think like Jesus. So Paul says, well, but if you want to know what it means to think like Jesus, you, you, you got you to gotta sing the tune. 
And, and he goes to this. Um, this is in a different translation, the J Jerusalem Bible, but it's an ancient hymn. It, it may be one of the chronologically earliest scriptures in the New Testament. It, it, it is something that, that probably Paul did not write, but something that he's quoting. It was a song they sang. It's, it's an insight into how early Christian worship went. They, they sang this song right at the beginning. His state was divine, yet he didn't cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself to assume the condition of a slave. That, that slave word there kind of gets at it. And becoming as men are and being as all men are, he was humbler still, even to accepting death, death on a cross. It's the first kind of two verses of the hymn. And, and then Paul kind of says, do you know the tune? You know, if I, if I were up here and I went uh, toward it, it started saying, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, Already the tune's in your head, right? You can, you can, uh, you can sense it in your head, um, the, the, the tune to Amazing Grace, that, that wonderful song. They must have had a tune to this song, and as soon as he started with those words, they knew the tune. The question with the church today is, do we still know the tune? Or in... In all the stuff that we've done to create church, all the administrative apparatus, all the, um, the stuff, you know, the buildings and everything else, have we lost the tune? Are we still singing the same song as the early church sang? Okay, that's the question. So we ought to look at the song just a little bit, huh? It's about seeing Jesus. You know, it starts off, uh, um, who being in very nature God, uh, the word there is morphe, uh, from which we get a lot of other words in English, but, um, but, but it, like words like transform, it, it means to have a form, a shape. And it's, it says, he was... Um, in the shape of the divine, the shape of God. But the fact is that he didn't look like that. I mean, you remember that famous uh, uh, scene in the middle of uh, Matthew and the middle of Mark. It's, it's in both of the Gospels. Uh, and and uh, Jesus, um, he's, he's been up north, and he, uh, he turns to his disciples and he says, so what are people saying about me? And, and they say, well, some say you're you know, this prophet or that prophet or John the Baptist or whatever. And then he says to them, and this is the question that he puts to us, who do you say that I am? Everybody has to answer that question. Ultimately, everyone has to answer that question. Who do you say Jesus is? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, in the very form of God, you know? And then Jesus says, well, uh, I got to tell you something, Peter, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to meet up with the authorities there. The authorities are going to put me to death. And Peter takes him aside and says, no, 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 that's not who you are. You are divine. You are not human. And, and Jesus says to him, get behind me, you opponent, you Satan. How many times does Jesus say to the church today, get behind me, you opponent? Because what you're saying is not the things of God, but the things of human beings. This is your dream. This is not what God is about. Who being in the very shape of God came down, came down and lived among us and died and took on, it says, same word, morphe, the shape of a slave. The key word in the whole song is the word that's translated emptied himself. Here it's he made himself nothing. He emptied himself 
by taking the very nature of a servant. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. That's how the old translation went. It, it, the, the word for that was translated grasped is actually a word which means something like a prize. He didn't think it a prize to be gained. He didn't grasp at divinity. But instead he lived among us. He lived a hard life. He died a hard death. He hung around with people that the society considered to be lowlifes. And yet that's the way not only of Jesus, but of God. Henry Now, you, you, some of you know Henry Nowen. Um, oh, actually, we should, we should look at this text. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Henry Nouwen was a, a Catholic priest who wrote a lot of books on spirituality, and if you don't know those books, those are worthwhile books, and, um, and you, you might want to pick one up. Uh, Henry died probably a decade ago or so. He died young. In, in one of his books, he talks about downward mobility. This is what he says. He says, uh, the great paradox which Scripture reveals to us is that real and total freedom is found only through downward mobility. He emptied himself. He came down. It, if you want to know what is the mind of Christ, what does it mean to think like Jesus? To think like Jesus isn't to go up, it's to go down. Which goes against everything that we think and believe. Now, I, I, at this point, I think we, 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 make a, we have a confusion in the church, and, and so I, I want to talk just a bit about this, because one of the things we say to our children is, you ought to, you know, achievement is important, right? We, um, we tell them that they ought to get good grades. You know, we don't say to them, um, okay, uh, you know, a kid comes home, and Johnny comes home, and he's got a, a D, and we say, well, you know, we really hope you got an F, because... Um, that would be to think like Jesus, right? I mean, we don't do that. We believe in achievement. We tell our children to, to, to grasp it at, at, at the, the best they can do, you know, try to do the best you can do. We, we do that for our, our whole life, our sports teams, right? Cubs? Yeah, <laughs> a few Cubby fans here. You know, it, this is kind of a dilemma for Cub fans, of course, because for a long time, the Cubs' identity was that they were the, uh, the lovable losers, and so now that they've won, but, but you know, even though they all, all the Cub fans always said, we love them because they lose, as soon as they won, they said, let's win another one, right? I thought I'd put all the champions up there. So the Penguins, that's for the Canadians here. You notice that they're, they're never, it's never a Canadian team, you know. That wins the Stanley Cup. Um, the Cavaliers, the Broncos, oops, they lost. Um, <laughs> my team, they lost. <laughs> so, so, so the question is, uh, how do we deal with this kind of downward mobility idea? Is that just, you know, Henry Nowen, who's a, who's a priest, you know, and, and he can talk like that, but actually everybody really believes that what we ought to do is achieve as much as we can, get as much money as we can, go up as high as we can, try to, you know. The fact is that God doesn't have anything against excellence. Achievement. You know, this is especially difficult for pastors because pastors, in their heart of hearts, they want to, you know, they want to be uh, accepted. They want, the, they want the church to grow. They want everything to reflect well on them, all of that. And then they go home and they feel awful because they're not doing it the way they're supposed to be doing it, right? But God loves the human race. God created us to achieve. God created us to do creative things. God created us to, to take the possibilities of the world and use them in ways that, that reflect glory back to him. Right? Nothing wrong with achievement. But now here's the truth. This is the biblical truth. This is the Jesus truth. All your achievements will never get you to God. If you want to get to God, you have to go not up. 
but down. It's the paradox of religion. All religions, and this includes the Christian religion, this includes churches, this includes a lot of things that we do religiously, is an attempt to climb the mountain. We think that if, you know, if we work hard enough and we do all the right spiritual things and we climb the mountain, that finally when we get to the top of the mountain, we're going to see God up there. And, and, and this is what the Christian faith says, that you can climb the mountain all you want to, it's not a bad thing, but when you get up there, you're going to find out that God isn't there, that he came down. And he's walking in the valley among poor people, Samaritans and sinners and the likes of that. So if you want to think like Jesus, if you want to think like Jesus, come down, okay? Here's now and again. Now now and... uh, Towards the end of his life, he, he was a great achiever. He, uh, he taught at Harvard, he taught at Yale, you know, he, he, uh, he, he had a great academic career. Um, and then, uh, and towards the end of his life, he met um, a, a man named Jean Vanier, and Jean Vanier uh, uh, had a, a ministry in France called L'Arche, which um, was a ministry to uh, mentally um, challenged adults. And there was an offspring, uh, a shoot of, um, of L'Arche in Toronto, I think, and it's called Daybreak. And now, and this guy who taught at Harvard and Yale went to Daybreak. When I came to Daybreak, I was asked to spend a few hours with Adam, one of the handicapped members of the community. Each morning, I had to get him out of bed, give him a bath, shave him, brush his teeth, comb his hair, dress him, walk him to the kitchen, give him a breakfast, bring him to the place where he spends the day and during the first few weeks I was mostly afraid always worrying that I would do something wrong or that he would have a seizure as the weeks passed by though I discovered how I had come to look forward to my time with Adam my time with Adam became my most precious time of the day and when a friend asked me one day couldn't you spend your time better than working with this handicapped man was it for this type of work that you got all your education I realized I couldn't explain to him the joy that Adam brought to me. Go down. Go down. That's where you meet God. It's the Jesus joy. We already quoted this in the service. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him. If you want to touch the joy of God, You touch the joy of God, not by going up, but by going down. You touch the joy of God in the valley. You touch the joy of God when you touch suffering, when you touch poverty, when you, when you do things like the Mexico trip, when you do things like the Esther school, when you do things like that, you touch the very joy of Jesus, and that is what we are about. Our achievements are good, but they won't get us there. So I have a couple of pieces of, of advice. My whole life says now, and I have been surrounded by well-meaning encouragement to go higher up, and the most used argument has always been you can do so much good there for so many people. I'm going to recommend to you the discipline of small things. I think we are the people of small things. God gives us the kingdom in a way that he says, you can't build it on your own. As soon as Christians think they can build the kingdom, and I know that gets put into mission statements, we are going to build the kingdom here. That's, that's, God builds the kingdom. We just do small things which testify to the existence of the kingdom. Okay? I've always loved the story about a colleague of mine I won't give you his whole name, but we'll call him Henry. Henry was a pastor of a big church, and he went on a mission trip one day, and um, on, when he got on the mission trip, some people in his mission group complained that the, um, that the bathroom was dirty. And the next morning, some of them got up, and when they got up, they found Pastor Henry on his hands and knees scrubbing the bathroom. Go down. The discipline of small things. And if I could tell a story about myself, it's it's a story about 
someone, we'll call him Jim. He was um, mentally ill, and he had, uh, he had been divorced actually twice. And, when, and, and after his first divorce, he was, the judgment was that he had to pay child support, but, but Jim couldn't hold a job. He could barely keep himself together. He had, to, he had barely enough money to survive on. He was no way he could pay child support. So, of course, he was hugely in arrears on his child support. And a new attorney general came, um, came to office in Michigan, and this guy was going to come down hard on the deadbeat dads, which all sounds good. He put up billboards even on the freeway saying that he was going to do this. And, um, and so one of the first people they picked up was Jim. And they hauled him off to, uh, to Pontiac from a couple of hours, an hour and a half or so from, from where we were, and um, they put him in jail, and they didn't take his medication, so he was um, really freaked out, and he's in the jail cell for this, for, and then in the morning, um, they, they bring him out, and they bring him in front of a judge, and the judge you know, looks, takes one look at him and realizes this guy's never going to be able to pay child support, and... Um, and so um, he says, just release him. But now he is an hour and a half away, and he gets a phone call. So he calls me. And he says, can you come and pick me up? It was a busy day. I drove an hour and a half, picked him up. He got in the car. He said, uh, Adrian always liked this part, he said, uh, I was, uh, I'm hearing voices. And I said, ignore them. <laughs> Being the sophisticated, you know, kind of, kind of guy that I am. Um, and we drove back. And I can tell you that I got a whole lot closer to God doing that than I would have been spending another hour and a half or three hours in my office. come down it's the small things you do those are the ones that you will uh, that, that God uh, you know if if someday in heaven they play the videotape of your life it will be those small things it will be the 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 Henry on his knees in the bathroom that will show up big in heaven come down the discipline of small things that's what we're about we don't have to do great things do the small ones, whatever it is, you, you'll know. The second thing is to resist the devil's snares. It's, it's the corollary of that first one. So, so you know how that goes. Uh, it, it, Jesus is, is uh, baptized as a young man. He's baptized by John. He is now ordained for ministry. He goes off, and the Spirit takes him out into the desert, and um, there he meets the devil. And, and, and the devil says to him, Jesus, you know, you can do great things. You can turn um, stones into bread. Imagine that. Imagine that you could turn stones into bread. You know, what a great thing that would be. What a great ministry that would be. There are hungry people in the world. Let's feed them. And, and, and Jesus says, that's not what I'm about. And then the devil takes him on top of the temple and says, jump off. The angels will catch you. Spectacle. Imagine how spectacular that would be. You know, you do a spectacular ministry, the crowds will gather. And Jesus says, that's not what I'm about. The devil takes him up on the high mountain and shows him the kingdoms of the world and says, all of that can be yours. And Jesus says, that's not what I'm about. But sometimes the church is about those things. We have to come down. Think like Jesus. And then one more thing, which, which is the way the song, if you're going to sing the song, you have to, this is the concluding verses. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want to just go back. You see that verb? Therefore, God exalted him. God raised him up. You don't have to raise yourself up. 
Resurrection is not something that starts with us. No matter how low you are, no matter how far down you go, God will raise you up. Resurrection is not just about being raised on the last day. It is about that, but it's not just about that. Resurrection is about the fact that God takes the little things you do. God takes the humiliations of the cross. God takes the small things, and he will raise us up. Okay? We don't have to worry about it. Sometimes you think, you know, I did this little thing and it was so quietly done, you know, and, and nobody ever noticed. Well, guess who noticed? God noticed. And one day, when your story is told, not, not the story that's told at your memorial service, but the story that's told in heaven, they will tell that story and, and they will raise up what you did and say, here, he or she thought like Jesus. So cross point, you don't have to be the biggest church in the world. You don't have to be the most spectacular church in the world. You don't have to get everything right. God calls us to do the small things, and there are so many stories here, so many stories here of people touching lives, doing small things in the world, and God will raise us up. Pray with me for that. Lord God, help us to think like Jesus. Not to think in terms of the grand things, but to think in terms of the small things. Not to think in those things which will bring us up, but those things which will bring us down. Help us, Lord, to be a people who has the courage to follow you to the cross. And so we pray, Lord. That as we gather together, as we are instructed, as we're shaped, as we become your people more and more deeply, that you'll give to us together the mind of Christ. For it is in his name that we ask this. Amen. Uh, before we stand, I, uh, I've been thinking about this kind of all morning. I think God just kind of put this on my heart. We don't do this very often at this church, so if you're a visitor, don't uh, hope this doesn't scare you off. But, uh, man, all this morning, not just in the sermon, but different things that have uh, come my way today.